Welcome to my Yotobs. My name is Alana and I review books on this channel. And today we have a very exciting book to review. Bring up the bodies by the late and the great Haley Mantel, Mantel, who unfortunately passed away um, this autumn. Um, and so let's get into this book because Hilary Mantel, what a genius. Let's talk. I do have a review of Wolf Hall. I, re I read it last year, but that was pre-YouTube days. So I will link in the description my um, written review for that. So if you would like to know what I thought about that book, I enjoyed it. Spoiler, I enjoyed it. I gave it a four out of five. Uh, you can read my thoughts there. So I'm going to dive into this one because I have quite a bit to talk about and I don't want to belabor this. <laughs> Let's go. The order goes to the tower, bring up the bodies, deliver, that is, the accused men. So this is Bring Up the Bodies is the second installment of the infamous Wolf Hall trilogy in which we are in the court of Henry VIII, but we are in the perspective of Thomas Cromwell in all the drama. You know, what is it about the Tudors that never ceases to be boring? What is it about the Tudors? I don't know. So where does Bring Up the Bodies pick up? Don't worry, this will be spoiler free. So Bring Up the Bodies by Hilary Mental, like I said, is the second installment of the Wolf Hall trilogy. And it picks up right where Wolf Hall ends. Anne Boleyn is queen. And Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine, has been ostracized. Like, he pretty much exiled that woman. He ain't right. However, Henry and Anne's relationship, by the end of Wolf Hall, in the beginning of this one, has started to get tense and rocky. And Henry is now paying attention to G Jane Seymour. Thomas Cromwell is now chief master. He, that boy started from the bottom, now he's here. Okay. And as rumors are brought about Anne begin to spread that she out here just doing her tang and everybody else's tang. Okay. The king becomes King Henry. Anybody else need to say anything else about that dude? Anne out here allegedly doing all these things. Cannot confirm or deny. The king is like, Jane, I want Jane. And so Cromwell knows he has to play this game, get the king what he wants in order to maintain favor with the king. However, we all know, most of us know, that the drama surrounding Anne does not end up good for Anne. I mean, the girl done lost her head. Not a spoiler alert, it's history. Her head got disconnected from her body, okay? And this leaves, I mean, it's just turmoil. And this ultimately will also end up leaving Cromwell on shaky ground, which we're going to pick up in the third book when I read that next year. But <laughs> cue the drama. Like, my guy has six wives and he took the heads of two of them. Did Henry, he didn't, but did Henry ever look, do the Michael Jackson and look at himself in the mirror and say, maybe it's me? Maybe I need to look at the man in the mirror and adjust myself. Maybe it's me. It was, bruh, it's you. Mantle is a master storyteller and her ability to be, to bring Cromwell to life is truly something to behold. Cromwell has always been an interesting historical figure for many. And even though he is the main focus of this narrative, he still comes across vague and cryptic with a lot of duality. And as a reader, this happened in the first book and this continues to happen in the second book. You sometimes still don't know how to feel about Cromwell, but that's exactly what Mantle wants. She's writing with him. She writes him with such complexity. There are moments where he's really endearing. Mantle humanizes him a lot. He has a lot of love and affection for his family, his dogs. He still misses his, his deceased wife and he knows he won't ever marry her because in the back of him, it, it, sorry, remarry because in the back of his mind, he knows he doesn't really think that he can replace her, but he's still in the political arena. And my man is savage, cutthroat, cruel, and ambitious. I don't care how much you love your puppies. He's still playing the political game. And in order to do that, you have to let go of some moral and ethical judgments. 
I was a side note, I was listening to a psychologist once and she was saying how only certain types of personality types end up in positions of power at this caliber. She's like, you have to be, you have to be a little crazy to do that because your very nice people don't ever want to get involved in that. <laughs> There's a certain personality type that makes it to the top like this. All right, my boy Thomas, give him a dirty look and he'll gouge your eye out. Trip him and he'll cut off your leg. But if you don't cross him, he's a very gentleman. Mainly, he has brought this about by hanging people. Not many, just the right ones. It's an art, a necessary art. Again, in order to, to, to go about hanging somebody, to be involved in that process, no, thank you. I personally want no parts of it, but he wanted that parts of it. So, okay. Also, Cromwell is a man of humble beginnings. And despite how he's able to climb this social ladder and this political ladder, he is never really truly accepted as the member, as a member of the aristocracy. This is heavily focused on, I keep burping. It's because I had a bowl of kimchi before I came on to record. Bald and probiotics. Okay. Kimchi. If I could be a side dish, I would be kimchi. Kimchi is amazing. Okay, it's delicious and it's good for you. Man, I really want some Korean food. Mm. If I could knock out all cuisines and I can only eat one cuisine culturally for the rest of my life, it would be Korean food. This has nothing to do with this review, but I, now I'm hungry. And so we, we focus a lot on, on Cromwell's background and his social status and how others perceive him in the first book. And this continues and to bring up the bodies. So he... The fact that he's not truly of the stereo of the aristocracy is never forgotten and others don't forget it. It's always mentioned. Uh, Mantle also does this to show how she's also drawing attention to England's system of social stratification, especially during this time, which in this book we're starting in 1535. And so here, here's how one character addresses Cromwell. Get back to your abacus, Cromwell. You are only for fetching in the money. When it comes to the affairs of nations, you cannot deal, deal. You are a common man of no status, and the king himself said so. You are not fit to talk to princes. So with that, it's a nice segue when it says, she says you are not fit to talk to princes. is because in Bring Up the Bodies, Mantle goes into this relationship between Henry and Cromwell. That is also a game of politics. Henry is ultimately the mastermind here. He's the king. But Henry was also no dummy. I mean, the man was insane. I don't care what anybody says. He crazy. Bro, you had six wives and you took the heads of two of them. You're crazy. But the man was also a mastermind. You can't deny that. And so Henry is a master at moving the pieces around him on a chessboard. And he knows how to, like any good politician, he knows how a person in power knows how to emit information or provide it, depending on who he's talking to or depending on what the circumstances are. And we see how Cromwell more and more starts to be on some of the outskirts of some of these plans in this book in particular. And when you're at court and you're playing the game at court, this is going to come back and bite him in the butt and have future dire consequences. It's also very telling, and Mantle does it so subtly, with who the king is starting to favor and who he's beginning to push away. And she, she is a, ma this, is, this is so cliche, but she is a master of showing and not telling. I mean, chef's kiss. It looks as if Henry is carrying on two foreign policies. One, he, referring to Cromwell, knows, and one he doesn't. You can be merry with the king. You can share a joke with him. But as Thomas More used to say, it's like sporting with a tamed lion. You toss its mane and pull, at, pull its ears. But all the time you're thinking, those claws, those claws, those claws. I'm going to shift away from Cromwell and, and Henry and a trauma. It made trauma and drama. There's a lot of there's a lot of trauma in this book. <laughs> Just because these people, especially we know what happens to them, so we're like, my guy, you you finna die. Um, not in this book, but he will die. Um, 
we're going to shift to the ladies, our leading ladies, Anne and Jane. So I would say, I don't think anybody can really dispute this, Anne Boleyn is one of the most infamous queens in British history. One could argue she's probably one of the most infamous queens, period. Because she she lost her head. <laughs> she was wife two of six. And like Cromwell, Mantle portrays her with obscurity and we can't quite grasp her fully. She has motives, yes, but there's a part of her true personality that will always remain an enigma. Did she really have multiple affairs or not? I don't think we'll ever know because again, people are willing to fabricate situations about her in order to get Henry's ultimate, to achieve Henry's ultimate goal. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. There are some historians, I did some research, there are some historians who would say that it's possible that she was having extramarital affairs and some say that she didn't. So I do think that, let's say she, let's assume that there was, she was had some tangs going on, but I think that there were some extra dudes, I'm playing devil's advocate, extra dudes thrown in there who she didn't have affairs with, but they wanted to make her look as egregious as possible so Henry had an excuse to axe her, literally. And they brought in a swordsman, they didn't use an axe, but okay. So let's, let's chat about Anne. Here we go. I cannot understand her. One moment she is reading out Master Tyndale's gospel. The next moment she opens her lips and out slides the devil's tail. Anne is also caught in this political game and we, she also played the game to get in the position that she was in as queen, ousting, helping to oust Catherine. But once she has her position of queen, can we fully blame her for doing what she had to do to maintain her position and not be overthrown by Jane? Women age, men like variety. It's an old story. And even an anointed queen cannot escape it to write her own ending. So why Jane? Why is Jane now her rival? Henry is seeking the exact opposite of Anne. Jane is quiet and meek, seemingly shy and naive. However, one also can't help but think that Jane was is being counseled to do this by design. And also it's pretty agreed upon that she would, the people, she had people who knew how to coach her. It's like PR for the 16th century. <laughs> so Jane had the likes of Cromwell and her own family members coaching her on how to act. It was very well known that um, Henry was looking for the antithesis of Anne. And that's why they were seeking Jane. Jane was considered to be a plain woman. And so Jane knew how to also play the part. She had little choice in the matter, especially in the 16th century. The king is pursuing you. How do you tell the king no? You kind of don't, or who knows what's gonna happen to you. Also, your family is looking at you to also um, promote their own ambitions or to, to move forward with their own ambitions. If Jane could veil her face completely, she would do it and hide her calculations from the world. So there's so much to study within this book and look at not just this, but Wolf Hall bring up the bodies with the characters that these infamous and iconic British English historical figures that Mantle has brought to life. And she does it in such a great way. And the way that she portray, portrays all of these characters with this bit of ambiguity ultimately also goes back to how Mantle is saying we still don't really know, which is one thing that I noticed because Mantle is constantly referring in, in these books to myths and mythological creatures and characters as well as how the truth is often concealed and manipulated in order to perceive a certain outcome. So in doing so, Mantle is shrouding her own narrative in this element of mysticism. Cromwell, Anne, Henry, Jane, we will never truly know what happened because we weren't there. We will never truly know what they were like because we were not there. And you know, people like to say 
Those who win get to write history. You know, those who have the power get to shape the narrative. So we're working with narratives that have survived. We're working with the narratives of those who had the privilege of writing the narrative from the original source, you know, those, the, or the original sources that were, that we have, you know, there's a lot that's done by design. And so, and also these are characters and these are events in history that people love to study. People have loved to adapt to film. I mean, the amount of Tudor historical fiction is endless <laughs> and people have really turned it into a myth of its own. So as time passes, these people and these circumstances become more and more mythological in status. And so that is one reason why I actually think that you get a lot of imagery in in a mantle referring to ancient myths in this book. There's a lot, there's a, at least at least three references to Heracles and his labors. We get images, images of phoenixes. In Wolfhall in particular, she has a whole chapter on um, British Celtic myths. And so I think she's doing that on purpose. Then I think, I know she's doing this on purpose. Everything, every word on the page that Mantle writes is calculated. What is the nature of the border between truth and lies? It is permeable and blurred because it, because it is planted thick with rumor, confabulation, misunderstandings, and twisted tales. Truth can break the gates down. Truth can howl in the streets. Unless truth is pleasing, personable, and easy to like, she is condemned to stay whimpering at the back door. So let's wrap this up. Bring up the bodies. I think Like Wolf Hall is excellently crafted. It's very well written. Ha Mansell is a master at being cryptic. <laughs> and she constructs this really fascinating nar narrative while, be while having it remain somehow open-ended. And so it still feels a little bit mysterious. And like I said, like a mythology in her writing. There are times when her writing is, it seems simple, but it's deceivingly simple. Like I said, everything is calculated. And there are times when it seems very poetic. And so you sometimes she's shifting between myth and these different stories and it, and you don't even realize it's happening until you realize, well, I just see what she did there. She's probably, the late mantle was probably a genius. I'm going to say she's a genius. Um, I enjoyed Wolf Hall. I gave it a four to five, but I actually enjoyed Bring Up the Bodies a little bit more. I'll be wrapping up the trilogy next here with The Mirror and the Light or The Light and the Mirror. I can't remember which order it was in, but I will be wrapping up the trilogy next year. And so that is also a sneak peek into my 2023 reading list. I rated this book a four and a quarter out of five. Still wasn't quite a five for me. I'm very picky with my five star reads. Um, but I enjoyed this one. Are you a fan of the Wolf Hall trilogy? Have you read either of these or, 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 or are they on your TBR? Are you interested in reading them? Let me know your thoughts below. As always, feel free to like leave me a comment and subscribe. And if you feel like doing so, please feel free to follow me on the Instagrams where I get up to other shenanigans. It's still bookish shenanigans, but other shenanigans. And that is actually where all of my book content goes live first. Um, YouTube is always very behind Instagram. <laughs> but I will see you guys in the next one where we will have, as always, more book reviews. I've got, I'm looking down here. I've got Troy coming up by Stephen Fry and Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre will be fun to review. I will see you guys in the next one.